Hello. We continue our conversation with Gleb Nasovsky about the beliefs of the Great Empire. You can explore this topic visually at the new Chronology Multimedia Museum in Yaroslavl. The extensive museum exhibition consists of 14 thematic halls spread across three floors. The history of the Great Empire is presented here chronologically, starting from the birth of the first state in the Nile Valley to the period of the empire's final dissolution in the 18th century. Given the size of the exhibition, visitors can explore the museum in one visit or make multiple visits. The ticket to the new Chronology Multimedia Museum is also valid on the following day after the purchase. Gleb Vladimirovich, hello. Hello, it's a pleasure to continue. Gleb Vladimirovich, in our previous conversation, you spoke about the fundamental disagreements between the royal and apostolic Christianity, which eventually led the followers of these beliefs to a military confrontation in the late 14th century. Please tell us how this happened. I depicted apostolic Christianity with a dashed line because it wasn't dominant but existed. And in blue, we have the royal Christianity, which was dominant. What happened in 1370 or 1380? The year 1370 is depicted in icons. Not many people understand this today. The three letters in Christ's halo represent the year 1370 from the era of Adam. It's written as 878, the 6000 is omitted, as usual. This is 1370 if we count according to the common era. Or it could be the year 1380, the Battle of Kulikovo. A difference of 10 years. Perhaps the Battle of Kulikovo actually happened in 1370, or something began in 1370, and in 1380, the battle occurred that concluded this confrontation. During this time, the apostolic Christians were simply an institution without power in the state. They had big influence, academic schools, a cohesive and developed organization with their hierarchy, but they weren't in power. How did they manage to defeat the royal Christians, who had all the armed forces of the empire at their disposal and held undisputed power within it? Such things can happen in our history and in human history in general. It's important to understand that history is complex and has pivotal moments. What happened? Essentially, science prevailed. Within the apostolic monasteries, there was science, not theology, but natural science. During this dashed line period, apostolic Christians were not engaged in theology. They didn't have much time for theology. Their focus was primarily on natural sciences. In my previous lecture dedicated to languages, I've mentioned that scholars of that time wrote in Arabic. Uh, 
A great battle occurs between Constantine, who aims to bring the apostolic Christians to power, and the imperial family. Yes, he's an emperor, one of the emperors, but he opposed the entire imperial family and emerged victorious. By defeating them, he altered the situation in the empire and transformed theology in the sense that the emperor ceased to be considered divine. Constantine the Great was considered divine by virtue of being an emperor before his victory. After his victory, he willingly shed his divine status and embraced apostolic Christianity. This is a well-known painting in the Vatican. Maxentius, a.k.a. Mamai, represents the royal Christianity. Constantine the Great is Dmitry Donskoy. This is the Battle of Kulikovo. It was actually fought in the area where the city of Moscow is located today. Of course, at that time, Moscow did not exist there. It took place where the Yauza River flows into the Moskva River. This, indeed, is the Yauza River. Here, the creme de la creme of the armed forces of the Great Empire with its capital in the Vladimir Suzdal Russia met its demise. How does this appear in Russian history? It's history that was later taken to the Vatican and embellished with various colors but still retaining many details. In fact, we know more about our Russian history from Vatican and Italian sources of that time than from Russian sources. And I'll explain why. It was described there in the guise of Roman history. And here is the same event, but seen through the eyes of a contemporary artist, titled, The Battle of Kulikovo. This is how modern artists depict it. And here's a painting by a Russian portraitist Arrest Kiprensky, Prince Dmitry Donskoy after the Battle of Kulikovo, from 1815. He received a major gold medal from the Academy of Arts for this work. See the ancient attire they're wearing? Dmitry Donskoy and all around him have this ancient style. This is another painting from around 1824, I believe. Here, there's slightly less antiquity. They had started reading Nikolai Karamzin's History of the Russian State, and there's a bit less influence from antiquity. Nevertheless, this is a transitional phase. And this is a very intriguing painting that I captured in the Vatican. It's a Christian church. Here, a crucifixion cross is erected, and on the floor lies a broken statue of an emperor. Meaning, they embraced apostolic Christianity, removed the statue of the emperor from its pedestal, and crudely shattered it. He stood here, and they were supposed to pray to him. But they roughly shattered it and raised the crucifixion cross. It's a very expressive painting. This is exactly how it happened. The images of emperors were removed and broken in the temples. The emperor ceased to be considered divine. By the way, here's the face of the emperor. He's depicted as Mercury, wearing a cap. One of the emperors, and his face is what I would call very Slavic, now lies broken. This icon depicts Sergius of Radonash. He invented gunpowder. This is the Battle of Kulikovo. On the left is Dmitry Donskoy, on the right is Mamai and his troops. They are crossing the Yauza River. It's also called the Nepriadva. In the Chronicles, the Mamai troops cross the Yauza Nepriadva, enter the battle and they are miraculously defeated. Why miraculously? This miracle made a huge impression on everyone. 
How could the most capable troops be defeated by the militia? The fact is, that on the side of Constantine the Great, also known as Dmitry Donskoy, there was merely a Christian militia. He had a small professional regiment, but mostly it was a Christian militia. And how did the Battle of Kulikovo begin? When the Mamai troops crossed the Nepriadva Yauza, they completely crushed the entire regiment that opposed them and pushed forward. On a forested nameless hill, which hangs over the field where the Yauza Nepriadva flows into the Moskva River, there's the Ivanovsky Monastery in Moscow today, and Starosatsky Lane. Approximately in that area stood cannons. They were the very first cannons. The forces of the royal Christians moved from right to left. When they pushed forward, they crushed and eliminated Dmitry Donskoy's main regiment and approached this hill. It was on their right side. It hung over them, and unexpectedly cannons started shooting from there. They had never seen or heard the sound of firearms before. It was the very first use of firearms in history. Some people were killed, but mostly they were frightened. Especially because the war was religious. They believed that the Christian apostolic God from heaven had turned against them. And they simply scattered in fear. I'd like to remind once again that the era of hand-to-hand -hand combat was distinct from the later and more familiar era when people kill each other from a distance, by pulling a trigger, through gunfire. Back then, to kill an opponent, one had to approach them closely and take their life. Of course, they used bows, but primarily it was face-to-face -face combat. Therefore, to appear more fearsome, to terrify the opponent, tall headgear was very important. Psychology played a crucial role. How to look someone in the eyes to make them falter, to make them feel at least somewhat subdued, which gave an advantage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And divine assistance was very important to them. They believed in the old ways that their God was above them, and on the other side, the enemy's God was above them. And these gods fought above them. And the key was how these gods would fight. If our God defeated the other God, then we would prevail. If not, we wouldn't. When the sound of cannons thundered, stones and bones loaded into the first cannons were hurled at them. These cannons were made of wood. They had never experienced or heard the sound of firearms before, and they ran away. From left to right, the forces of Dmitry Donskoy are marching, carrying the image of Christ's face. And here come the so-called Tatars, that is, the Mamai people. Because Tatars then meant something different. It referred to lightly armed forces. If today Tatars signifies a nationality, back then it had a different meaning. They also carry the same red standard, and the same Christ's face. They look exactly alike, with the same faces. Nowadays, they depict some narrow-eyed Tatars. In reality, even not Tatars, but some Mongols. They are armed the same, have identical faces, and carry the same colors. Gleb Vladimirovich, it's known that the Battle of Kulikovo was preceded by the battle on Piana River in the Nizhny Novgorod region. Please tell us why Sergius of Radonesh went there after the battle ended, and how the invention of gunpowder is connected to these events.
It's believed that Mamai himself wasn't present at the Piana River battle. His commander Arapsha was there. He inflicted a heavy blow and destroyed a fairly large army of Dmitry Donskoy. There are various opinions about the location of this battle. Several versions exist, but we consider the correct viewpoint to be that Russian forces of Dmitry Donskoy were positioned at a place called Garodina. Both sides' forces were Russian. Let's conditionally call them Russians and Tatars. I'll show you the location on the banks of the Piana River where the Tatars were situated on the opposite side of the Piana River. They unexpectedly crossed the river, attacked, and slaughtered their adversary. A great number of people were killed. Nearby is the sizable village of Klodbyshe which means graveyards. Until recently, it was named that way, and in Soviet times, it was renamed Gusovo. People still call it graveyards. Nearby is the place Kolodi which means hack logs, and all this is referred to as the town of Sergach, and it still exists. According to our reconstruction, this is precisely the place where Saint Sergius arrived to manufacture gunpowder. I'll explain later that gunpowder was made from corpses. He needed many corpses, and there were plenty here. This is a contemporary photograph of Garadana, an area overgrown with forests. Troops concealed themselves in this forest and thought they were safe. It was indeed a convenient place, but Arapsha outsmarted them. Here's what the map looks like. This is the battle site. And here's a map to help you understand how it all unfolded. Here's the city of Arzamaz, here's the town of Sergach, Garadana, and the town of Muram. This is the Nizhny Novgorod region, with dense forests. This is graveyards, now part of Sergach. This is the cathedral of the Archangel Michael in memory of those who fell at Piana. It exists, I'll show you a photo later. Here they were buried. And here, very close by, are the so-called hack logs. Let me tell you about them now. This is the church of the Archangel Michael in graveyards, dedicated to those who died in the battle at Piana. It was certainly rebuilt. This was in the 18th century, but it was built on the site of the old church, the cemetery church and cemetery chapel. This is the place where the main cathedral of Sergach is located. And here, a bit to the right, where it all gets lost in the trees, you find those very hack logs. This is a photograph of hack logs. There's a holy spring there. It's called hack logs. Here, Sergach started. Everything has been arranged there now. There's a very strong spring there. It's a baptistry, they draw water from it. This spring is truly strong. And everything is arranged there. There's a sign now that says it's the place of Saint Sergius and that he was there at a place called Hacklogs, doing something there. There was a spring, he built a chapel there, and he was engaged in something there. This place was started by Saint Sergius. Why hack logs, no one can really explain. What kind of hack logs? For some reason, hack logs. It's known that Saint Sergius was here. This is the site of the Piana battle, surrounded by huge cemeteries. And right by these cemeteries are these hack logs. 
an amazing place, from where the city of Sergach originated, the Sergachka River. The town of Sergach is named after Sergius. It's mentioned here about Piana, that many Russian warriors perished. And for some reason, after this, Sergius comes there and does something in the forest. Here are everywhere dense forests and bears. Even now, Sergach's coat of arms is a bear. There were a lot of bears there. Even during the 1812 war, they assembled a bear battalion in Sergach. They tried to train bears to fight against the French. They had a bear battalion in Sergach. There were many bears, and they trained them. It's a local trade. I remind you that in the book, The Life of Saint Sergius of Radonesh, it's mentioned that for some reason he left. But why, is it mentioned? He left, he was a hermit. After all, he went to the remote forest and lived there with a bear. There he built a certain chapel. Here he is with a bear. And here's the town of Sergach. Bears are everywhere there. It's the symbol of the town. This is the life of Sergius from the Trinity Lavra of Saint Sergius. There's something strange there. Of course, it's not proof, just an illustration. A curious expression that when Sergius lived in this remote forest, there were seeds for making heat potion. That is, some potion was created there. What kind of potion? I remind you that gunpowder used to be called potion or poison. Today, we say, gunpowder, but in the past, it was called potion. Gunpowder mills were referred to as potion mills. So, potion is an old Russian word for gunpowder. The word, gunpowder, came later. The word, gunpowder, is abbreviated to just powder and appeared much later. And so, some kind of potion appeared from somewhere. What kind of potion? At first glance, it's not clear. It's like, he lived in a remote forest. What kind of potion? Especially some kind of heat potion. In the life of Sergius, it's not explained at all what exactly this potion was. It's mentioned that it was a dense forest, animals were around, a bear would come. All of this is mentioned. And some kind of potion was being prepared there, for making heat potion. I'm not trying to prove anything here. I'm just telling you how, according to our reconstruction, all of this was done. The first cannons were made of wood. This oak tree is cut down in those areas, in the Sergach district. Near the base, it's solid, and then, due to the moisture in the soil, starting from a certain height, the core separates. It can be simply pulled out. It doesn't get knocked out, it's just pulled out, and a hole is formed. In other words, a tube is formed, a barrel. But at the far end, if you don't cut off from the part where everything grew together, you get the muzzle of a cannon. This is the upper part. You can pour water on it, simply burn it, and you'll get a tube. Or split it and remove it. It's not that difficult, easier than drilling. Drilling is indeed difficult, but here, it's already done. This is the ready muzzle of the cannon. You just need to remove the core. This loose shell is completely separated, and it just needs to be taken out, and you can make a cannon. That's how they made the first cannons. The core has been extracted. It wasn't artificially removed here, it happens naturally. Several layers rotted, several rings, and the oak trunk, starting from a certain level, split into the core, 
which can be removed, and the surrounding tube. By the way, in these areas, they make pipes for sellers from such oaks. To avoid using metal, they make tubes to let air into the cellars. I want to remind you of a well-known story about Sergius. There was no water in that place. They had to walk far to get water. He struck his staff, and a stream began to flow, which turned into a river. Indeed, I've already shown that there's a strong spring in Hacklogs, a brook runs from there, which flows into a river. The river exists, it's called the Sergachka River. In Chronicles, it's named after Saint Sergius. They now try to show all of this near the Trinity Lavra of Saint Sergius. But in reality, there's nothing like that there that corresponds to the description in the life of Sergius. I remind you that Sergius was named Bartholomew. Sergius is his monastic name, and his baptismal name is Bartholomew. Before he became a monk, he was Bartholomew the Chernets, which is black. Black, in German translates to Schwartz, and Bartholomew is Berthold. This legendary figure is known as Berthold Schwartz. They themselves admit that these are all legends, myths. In reality, he never existed, but it's believed that there was such a Berthold Schwartz who invented gunpowder in Germany. Nowadays, in books they write that gunpowder was invented by the Chinese and other nonsense. They claim it was only invented for fireworks. In reality, according to European sources, which were unaware of the Chinese at the time and only learned about them in the 19th century when historians made it up, Gunpowder was invented in Europe by Berthold Schwartz in the 14th century. That's essentially what we say. Yes, it was invented by Bartholomew Black, but not in Europe, rather in Russia, and it was first used in the year 1380. By the way, in some European sources, it's written that gunpowder was first used in the year 1380 in a battle between the Genoese and Venetians. That's the Battle of Kulikovo. The year is correct. You see, he is mixed something, something is burning. And here's an icon of Saint Sergius. In the life of Sergius, it's written that fire descended into the cup. This is Saint Sergius. It's depicted at the Trinity Lavra of Saint Sergius, where I took a picture. Saint Sergius stands before the altar, a cup is in front of him, and the fire is going down to the cup. You can see flames there. This is the miracle of the holy fire, described in various ways. But in reality, it's the invention of gunpowder. I will now explain why this was forgotten. But first, a little more information. Don't think that Sergius' contributions to chemistry were forgotten. Inventing gunpowder isn't something that can be achieved by simply sitting and contemplating. It's a science, and a highly developed one. Saint Sergius established a vast number of monasteries. As we know, he traveled and founded monasteries that were under his authority. As we understand now, the field of chemistry developed within these monasteries. They wrote in Arabic. Indeed, there is a figure known as the father of chemistry. His Arabic name is Jabir, or that's how they pronounce it nowadays. In reality, if pronounced in Egyptian, it would be Gabir. And it's no wonder that in Europe his name is known as Gaber. So, the Arabic pronunciation was Egyptian, not Syrian. Nowadays, the Syrian pronunciation Jabir and not the Egyptian Gabir is in use. Egyptians don't use the J sound. Gabir or Gaber in European terms is the father of chemistry. 
There's a wealth of writings that describe saltpeter, acids, and various technologies. Historians place Gaber in the 8th century, and the writings date back to the 13th-14th centuries, but definitely no earlier than the 13th century. So, they have to invent a pseudo-Gaber. Yes, there was Gaber, and then in the 13th-14th centuries, some unknown author wrote under his name. He lived either in Spain or somewhere else in Europe. He wrote in Arabic as well. But he couldn't be Gaber because Gaber lived in the 8th century. Thus, he's a pseudo-Gaber. But he didn't consider himself a pseudo-Gaber. He wrote under Gaber's name. He mentioned sulfur and saltpeter. After all, the most important ingredient for gunpowder is saltpeter. He already had everything charcoal, saltpeter, and sulfur. What is the original gunpowder? It's a mixture of saltpeter, charcoal, and sulfur. Charcoal and sulfur were already known, and saltpeter was needed. Gaber had saltpeter, and he described how to obtain it. How was saltpeter obtained? Saltpeter was produced through the decay of organic residues. Roughly speaking, decaying bodies or excrement, both yield saltpeter, and limestone is needed too. Therefore, in the initial saltpeter pits and heaps, they mixed remains from slaughterhouses with blood, manure, anything organic. They initiated a controlled reaction, resulting in saltpeter. Why were monks the ones to come up with saltpeter? Not just because they had scientific knowledge. It's quite natural. Not some Chinese inventors of fireworks, but specifically monks. It's because monks worked with dead bodies, mummies, tombs. And it's known that saltpeter forms on tomb walls, in caves with many mummies. They couldn't have missed it. While working with mummies, relics, and dead bodies, Christian monks could have easily noticed the white deposits, scraped them off, accidentally mixed them, and realized that they explode. Today, saltpeter is still used as a fertilizer. Here, I'm showing a fragment from Jack Kelly's book, Gunpowder, Alchemy, Bombards, and Pyrotechnics. The first pages of the book are dedicated to all kinds of Chinese nonsense, claiming that the Chinese used gunpowder for fireworks a long time ago. This was all invented in the 19th century. But he correctly writes that a valuable source of saltpeter was buried soldiers' bodies. That's indeed how it was. To produce a large quantity of saltpeter, many bodies were needed. That's why Sergius came. Probably, experiments were already conducted, and he understood how to do it. But he needed large quantities to win in that major battle. And he found those quantities near the cemetery of a recent battle. Here, I provide the saltpeter recipe. See, how they mix it. Manure. Anything organic that can decay. The basis of saltpeter is organic matter because bacteria break down organic matter, but there can be different types of bacteria. It's the specific ones that facilitate the correct reaction. Therefore, it was necessary to allow air into the saltpeter pits, as otherwise, anaerobic bacteria would be the first to arrive, and they don't produce saltpeter. 
There's a certain chemical reaction, but I won't delve into those details now. Don't think that saltpeter forms through any type of decay of organic residues. No, not any. But it forms through decay involving certain bacteria. Here are pages from Gaber's alchemical works. There's a lot described here. Not just saltpeter, acids, metals, theory. It's believed that he adhered to Aristotle's theory. But in reality, according to the new chronology, Aristotle is from the 15th century, slightly later. Therefore, it's not Geber who adhered to Aristotle's theory, but rather Aristotle who adhered to Saint Sergius' theory. He's also Geber. What is Geber? Geber, Jabir, it's an Arabic word, and it means, irresistible force. Don't think of it as a proper name. All these authors' names are descriptive names. In other words, the name itself signifies, irresistible force and power. And by the way, Jabir or Gabir is an Arabic word that, in addition to, irresistible force and power, also signifies the name of the Orion constellation. It has two meanings the Orion constellation and irresistible force and power. I understand that I will face strong criticism for this, but nevertheless, I will still tell you about it. Sergius was with Dmitry Donskoy. Dmitry Donskoy is Constantine the Great. And who was with Constantine the Great? We know. Who was Constantine the Great's favorite? It was Arius, who was later condemned. He's now our main heretic, but he was Constantine the Great's favorite. As long as Constantine the Great was alive, he put Arius first and never mistreated him, although there were many attacks against Arius. Arius always declined the position of bishop. He was just a priest, although he could have become a bishop. The exact same pattern is seen in the pair Dmitry Donskoy, Sergius. Sergius was just a priest. He was offered the position of bishop many times, but he always declined. Therefore, they even created for him a title, the Higumen of the Russian land. He wasn't a bishop, not for the reason that they refused to make him one. It's strange, actually. Because in the church hierarchy, becoming a bishop is every priest's dream. It's an instant promotion. A bishop oversees the church, while priests simply serve. Everyone always wanted to move up the administrative ladder. And Sergius always refused it. That's well known. Arius behaved in exactly the same way. Immediately after the death of Dmitry Donskoy, Sergius dies. And immediately after the death of Constantine the Great, Arius dies. There are reports that Arius was killed, and I will now say that most likely Sergius was also killed. And here's a very important point. Here's another image of Geber. And here's Orion. We already know that the name Geber means Orion in Arabic. It refers to the Orion constellation. And not just the constellation, but also the mythological figure Orion. Who is Orion? Orion is a certain person who possessed the remarkable ability to kill. They say he boasted that he could kill all living things. He was the best archer of them all. He was famous for being a very skilled archer and boasted that he could kill all living things. In the end, the gods killed him. It's believed out of jealousy, as he hunted better than Artemis. There are many different versions of this myth. He was killed because he was too dangerous. By the way, this is Arius, or Ari, Arians. Returning to various myths about who these powerful Arians are, 
And this is Ari, who was their leader. He was the leader of entirely invincible Aryans who swept everyone from their path. This is a modern depiction of how Ari is envisioned. And here's Bartolomeo Colioni. This is the Italian reflection of the same Sergius of Radonash. And with the same name Bartolomeo, which is Bartholomew. Colioni is the equivalent of Kolomanskaya. Because when Moscow didn't exist yet, all these places were part of the town of Kolomna, which was situated where the Moscow River flows into the Ukha River. If a town stands where a smaller river flows into a larger one, the flow of the smaller river is controlled by the town. It dams up that river, and the entire flow of that river submits to the town. That's why Kolomanskaya is like a little Kolomna here in Moscow. Kolomna is at the mouth of the Moscow River, and Kolomanskaya is here. All these places were part of Kolomna before Moscow was established here. Bartholomew of Kolomna or Bartolomeo Colioni is known for being the first to use cannons and gunpowder in Italy. He manufactured gunpowder in Bergamo. Here's his tomb inside. I'll tell you right away that the tomb is empty and the sarcophagus is empty. It has been opened, and there's no one inside. This is how he is depicted. This window is made from cannons. These are all cannons, the historians themselves say this. All around are cannons. His coat of arms consists of three gunpowder flasks. Of course, it's not very decent to talk about this, but I'm not to blame here. Historians and local tourist guides came up with a completely indecent nonsense about these three gunpowder flasks, comparing it to the male genitalia. They claimed that he was so powerful that he had three of them on his coat of arms. Utter nonsense. This is precisely how the gunpowder flasks looked. The horn was sharpened at the end. So, what is a gunpowder flask? The gunpowder flask had a sharpened horn from which gunpowder was poured. And on the other side, there was a leather pouch into which the gunpowder was poured. It was tied up, and the horn was inserted into the end of this pouch. It covered this horn. At the end of the horn was a small hole, and gunpowder was poured onto the fire pan from there. Gunpowder was poured into the gunpowder flask when the pouch was untied and a substantial amount of gunpowder was poured inside. This is how all gunpowder flasks looked. This is how imagination works. When people no longer understand what's going on, their imagination works in a certain direction. And they proudly tell all tourists visiting Bergamo about it. And they make them rub it, you see? They're all rubbed off. Tourists rub it, and apparently, it brings some benefit. Gleb Vladimirovich, it's generally believed that Sergius of Radonezh died peacefully of natural causes. However, in your works, you say that he was most likely killed. Why do you think that? Let's open the page of the Russian Chronicle that describes the transfer of power from Dmitry Donskoy to his son Vasily Dmitrievich. 1390 is the year of the death of Dmitry Donskoy. He died, and his son, Vasily Dmitrievich, became the Grand Prince of Moscow. It's written and underlined here. In the year 6898, which is 1390, Vasily Dmitrievich the Grand Prince of Moscow and all Russia, took over the Grand Principality of Moscow. And what happens immediately after Dmitry Donskoy's death? Look at what happens. Some sort of plague strikes the Russian saints. 
In the same year, Metropolitan Piment dies. In the same year, Bishop Fedor dies. In the same year, Sergius of Radonesh dies. In the same year, Venerable Dmitri of Priluki dies. In the same year, Venerable Abbot Stefan, the brother of Sergius of Radonesh, dies. In the same year, Venerable Varv Ari of Chukloma dies. In general, in the Russian Chronicle, the deaths of saints are mentioned. But for so many to die at once, in one to two years, I've never seen that anywhere. It's truly astonishing. So, as soon as Dmitry Donskoy dies, not just any, but the most famous saints immediately die. How many more were not mentioned in the Chronicle? What's happening? Let me explain in more detail. Here's Arius, whom the Christian Church now curses under the name Arius and glorifies under the name Sergius. Let's go back to this image. This is apostolic Christianity. This is an institution. But it exists on the money of the parishioners, on their own funds, on the money of those people who voluntarily contribute something there. It's not a state church. The state church is the royal Christianity. They are self-sufficient, they have everything they need. They don't need apostolic Christianity. In reality, they didn't care about theological distinctions. They only wanted everyone to pray to Christ and to them. They considered themselves above any church hierarchy and didn't strive for a unified faith. Their main concern was that all faiths would pray to them, that alongside their own gods, people would erect statues of emperors. They looked down on this, regarding themselves as gods. They considered themselves divine and held any faith in high disdain, not seeing themselves as ordinary people who pray to some god. Now this divinity has passed. The Battle of Kulikovo happened, divine rulers were ousted, and humans took the helm of the empire. The imperial family became composed of humans, not gods. Apostolic Christians rose to power, and the church became a state institution. Science became state-funded. If we look back in history, what was science like? Initially, it was ancient science. Philosophers frequented academies with their private funds and discussed various matters. It wasn't science funded by the treasury. But when does state-funded science emerge? It emerges with the advent of apostolic Christianity. Historians describe this as a decline in the level of science. Earlier, science was free. Greek philosophers strolled through academies amidst gardens and engaged in philosophical discussions. However, with the arrival of apostolic Christianity, universities appeared, that is, state institutions funded by the treasury, where professors taught students. Historians say that they were taught all sorts of nonsense. They calculated how many angels could stand on the head of a pin and other nonsensical things. Yes, there was much nonsense, but there were also natural sciences. So, for some reason, when apostolic Christianity came to power, science shifted to state funding. Although this wasn't the case before, now we understand why. When does the ruling power become interested in science? 
when it brings benefit to the military. This has always been the case. It was also the case in our recent history with the atomic bomb when the Moscow State University was built and scientists began to get paid during the Soviet era. When? When the atomic bomb was invented. This has always been the case. And at that time too. In other words, Sergius of Radonezh invented gunpowder. This overturned the structure of the empire, the entire world. It became apparent that science is not just people having intellectual conversations. It can lead to the creation of weaponry that can wipe out the best armies. In reality, science has significant practical value in military affairs. Riding this wave of understanding, state-funded science emerged in the empire, and it has persisted since then. Originally, science was within the apostolic church. And the key figure in apostolic science was Sergius of Radonezh. He established his scientific schools in monasteries not only in Russia but also in Italy. Throughout the empire, he established places where gunpowder was produced and he taught how to make it. He must have been in Bergamo too, since there is his symbolic tomb there. Of course, it's a much later construction. They represent him this way, but they still remembered something. Within the apostolic church itself, when it began to rely on treasury funds and bishops started receiving salaries from the state, which they hadn't received before, a clash occurred between those inclined towards ideological and humanitarian thinking and those more inclined towards natural sciences. In other words, the natural scientific school of Sergius of Radonezh within the Apostolic Church caused irritation and fear. This is evident from the legends about Orion. He provoked fear. He said, I can kill everything that's alive. Because now he had invented gunpowder, but what would he invent tomorrow? We don't know. And those more inclined towards humanitarian and ideological activities actually better progress up the career ladder. It's known that along the hierarchical ladder funded by the treasury, they advanced excellently, much better than representatives of the natural sciences. Well, that's exactly what happened. When the apostolic church began relying on treasury funds, bishops became bureaucrats, and a rupture emerged among them, between naturalists and humanitarians, naturalists and ideologists. While Constantine the Great, also known as Dmitry Donskoy, was alive, he didn't allow any offense against Sergius, and the natural scientific part of the church flourished. But as soon as he died, those forces struck and annihilated natural science within the church as a discipline that frightened them, one they didn't understand and didn't want to comprehend. They considered it unnecessary. They believed they should focus on what they were capable of, humanitarian condemnations and various scholastic theories. Immediately, they started developing theology in a purely humanitarian manner. And the era of heresy began, 
where they began debating the nature of Christ, his divinity, the Trinitarian formula, and so on. Even if we examine the essence of the Arian controversy, today it's said that Arius was bad because he denied the divinity of Christ. That's not true. If we look at what Arius wrote, it's simply not true. Even an ecclesiastic historian Vasily Balatov in his works in the ecclesiastic history delves into this topic extensively and concludes that the heresy of Arius cannot be described in the language of the church. In other words, if we speak in the language of the Christian church, it's impossible to describe what Arius was guilty of and what was unorthodox about him. In reality, all his statements were quite orthodox. To describe where Arius was wrong, one must resort to the language of philosophy. This is what Balatov writes. It's truly the case. What is said about Arius now, that he denied the divinity of Christ, is untrue. If we speak in the language of the church, there were no differences. They wanted to find certain differences and found them. I won't go into that. Those interested can look into it, because we don't delve into theology at all, and we don't deal with it. But I want to note this point. Gleb Vladimirovich, thank you very much for this meeting. I thank you for organizing these broadcasts, which we need as well, because we also want to tell something to our readers in person. So, from our side, we're very grateful to you for providing such an opportunity. In a week, we will meet again with Gleb Nisovsky. Subscribe to our channel and come to the Multimedia Museum of the New Chronology in Yaroslavl. See you soon.